Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am very happy to be here and talk uh, about uh, numerical methods for solving quantum control problems. I would like to thank very much the organizers, Christiane, uh, Tobias, Michel, and Marcus. And uh, the talk is about uh, uh, two ways or two historically developed ways of uh, solving optimal control problems, one in the view of Lagrange, the other in the view of Pontryagin, which is later. And uh, I do this uh, by first introducing some specific problem and then uh, use also this opportunity to discuss the beauty of modeling by deciding what is our cost function. So the, I, I cannot change the page here. Let's see. Well, I will just... Uh, the, why optimal control problem in quantum mechanics is important is uh, something we all we know very well. And uh, the point that I would like to make that was made by Professor Koslo before is that, that since we are, we want to, to have a very high precision in the construction of our control functions, then the question is how can we obtain this precision by constructing very sophisticated codes that are able to reach very high accuracy in the solving the optimal system, which is the starting point for any numerical methods that we use. So to start with, I would like to present uh, a three-level system, which is actually well, very well known in uh, quantum optics and is now also playing an important role uh, in uh, quantum computation because it's a way to construct uh, a qubit but this is, in some sense, uh, a realistic one in the sense that the transition from one state to the other cannot be done directly. This transition is forbidden. You must go through a third state, which is actually the state where you have some dissipation, like uh, photon emission. So the, the structure in this case is a, a very small system with the three components of a complex uh, uh, vector, which is the state of the system. And uh, the modeling of this system is uh, uh, quite well known by the Schrodinger equation, where we can use uh, two representation, we can work with the one real con two real controls, or is the same. I work here now considering a complex control function, which is the function u with the two components. And as usual, we have uh, a drift, the part which is the free Hamiltonian and the control potential. Now, the, <clears throat> why I like to discuss this, uh, this kind of model, because I would like to show you uh, some very nice uh, possibilities in modeling our cost functional, where we do something which is not so usual. One is, uh, I have to pass through the third state, but I would like to stay there as less as possible. I mean, the occupation of this state should be reduced as much as possible. So uh, beyond the standard part, I would like to penalize the presence of the quantum system on the dissipative state. And the other thing, which is maybe more unusual in this community, is that I'm considering to have also not only the penalization of the control function u, but also of its first derivative. This is uh, changing many things mathematically, because if I just have the, the usual term L2, then my function is a L2 function. And maybe you wish to have a function that you can better implement in a device. And for this, you need a continuous function. And a continuous function, or a pulse function, I discuss later. And a continuous function is automatically obtained in mathematical terms because of bending by using a H1 cross functionality. So let me use this cost functional and uh, consider the control problem that is minimizing this functional subject to the, the, the constraint. I think this works, okay. So the optimal system is the usual one, but not really because, as you see, because I have the first derivative in the control function, my gradient, my L2 gradient is now having uh, this form. So it's like having a two-point boundary value problem 
with initial and by final value, which are also a modeling issue. It's like saying, I'm switching on and off the control in my system. The Hamiltonian, because I have a dissipative state, is a, the free Hamiltonian is a, a diagonal system for the two states, which are not dissipative, and dissipation is constructed via the environment laws of spontaneous photon emission in this complex term. So we have not unitary evolution. And the dipole matrix is the usual one, as uh, we've seen many times in these talks. So let's try to do a transition where I go from state one to state two. But as I told you, we need to go through the state three. Uh, <clears throat> one comment now is that if I talk, if I think of any optimization problem based on gradients, this is the L2 gradient. So this is the wrong gradient to do optimization because your controls function is in H1. So you need, by using Ritz theorem, transfer this to the form of a H1 gradient. And this is usually, many times, people forget about this, so optimization will not work. Uh, so let me start uh, making some comments about numerics. So one way to apply, to solve, this kind of conceptual problems, going back to methods which are 50 years old, like BFGS or MCG, which are actually equivalent, you will see that uh, these, these methods perform, uh, yeah, they perform well, <clears throat> and they could be made more fast by doing cascading approach. And uh, what I would like to, to comment here is, uh, first of all, a comparison with a monotone scheme, this uh, crank nichols monotone scheme, which is the one of the state of the art of monotone schemes, and observe that as much as I require a smaller and smaller accuracy, in the sense that the norm of the gradient must become small, because this is measuring how good I'm solving my optimality system. So if I require more and more precision, then I obviously I will have more and more computational effort, and this is also increasing by increasing the number of visualization points. And at some point, obviously, I would say, from my point of view, knowing the theory of these uh, things, is that uh, there will be no convergence of the monotone scheme. So it will not be able to reach the required accuracy. Another thing is that while this is, say, the canonical way to say optimal system solved, it is used numerically to consider this kind of uh, truncate, this kind of tolerance criteria which is how much is the functional changing along iteration. So these two are not equivalent. And in fact, even if I put the T to, T to minus eight, I will be far away to getting this 10 to the minus six. So this is something you would like uh, just to check. In any case, the, the interesting thing is that if I take a small tolerance, well, a large tolerance, 10 to minus four, this is the control function that I obtain with the monotone scheme. And uh, by increasing this, you see the control function will change drastically. So if when you are doing your device, we are, should be sure that we are getting the optimal control function and not something which is suboptimal. OK, so this is my first uh, comment, first message on numerics. This is about uh, the message about the modeling of the cost functional, obviously, as much as I increase the weight of the L2 control, I will have less and less, uh, uh, I would say, fidelity or reaching the target that I require. If I ask uh, to penalize uh, the, the third state, the anticipation state, then I will uh, I will imp improve in some sense because uh, I'm losing less in my transfer from state one to state two. And other comments is this is about the H1 component, the derivative of the control function. If I ask it to be smooth, then the, my space of control functions is smaller. And so the optimization will not get to the best minima I could get with just L2. OK, there are many other issues that uh, one should consider, first of all, it is not uh, obviously possible that you can use any control function. Usually, 
a, a real mechanic device which makes laser control has some limits on the maximum power that it can do. So you have some box constraints in the intensity of your device, and you you should then take care of this and implement things like uh, projections in the right uh, uh, spaces. And this is easy or not easy depending on the kind of numerical methods you are using. So <clears throat> this is just a picture to say that uh, solving the problem with NCG and making the transition, you see, we discover something which is beautiful because also mathematics discovers things. In fact, if I do of the control function coming from this setting, the spectral uh, decomposition of this control function, I discover that actually this is doing the stir up. So this is a counterintuitive uh, way to do pumping from one state one to state two. But I think you know stir up. Okay, so let me now change to another finite dimensional system. I'm talking only about finite dimensional system. Whatever I'm saying is true also for infinite dimensional systems and the codes and everything that have been done also in that case. So in the, in the case of uh, uh, spin systems, as you well know, we start from the Pauli equation with spinners, not the full Schrodinger equation. And we look at the lowest level where the, the only quantum numbers that we can change stating to the Sitting in the ground state, say staying in the ground state are the spin numbers. So if I look uh, at uh, spherical harmonics uh, uh, representation of the Pauli equation, and I cool down everything to this uh, part of the spin component, I get this kind of equation here, which is actually what we have seen in many talks. So this is uh, the free Hamiltonian, I will call it A, and these are the control functions, which are the two transversal magnetic fields. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, this is a, a very important model, and it can be made as large as you want if you think of many, many things. Okay, so uh, let me now uh, do something else. I change again my control, my functional. I do a functional which is uh, quite, uh, say, well-known and modern in the optimal control of partial differential equations. And I would like to introduce uh, you to this because it, you'll be surprised what is the power of the having a L1 cost, cost of the control in your function. The, uh, the problem is that when you have such a term, like when you had the constraints, your problem is not differentiable. So it's not so easy to write down the system as before, but uh, what we get is a lot, uh, a rich uh, result in terms of control functions that allow us to address issues like pulses. Okay, <clears throat> so let me now discuss this. We have a cost functional where the first part is say, the usual tracking of the final target, a L2 cost and a, L1 cost. Our uh, governing model is always the same. I refer now to a real representation of a controlled uh, quantum system. Okay, it can be also in numerically, if you think of a Schrodinger equation in infinite dimensions system, this is, will be exactly what you get from the numerical approximation. Okay, <clears throat> so there is a quite large, uh, uh, yeah range list of uh, samples where you apply. Okay, but my focus is now on having this in the function on, and then asking how can we solve this problem, okay? So I have now no differentiability, but there is, uh, you know, this is the history of mathematics. If something does not work like derivatives, well, you enlarge your space, which means you enlarge the concept of derivative until it's possible. And then you go on. And in this case, the enlargement is to go to sub-differentials, introduce the sub-gradients, and this is possible because this function, the L1 function, has some semi-smoothness property. So now I also add uh, to this problem, which is non-differential because of the L1 cost, I also add box constraints that can be given by laboratory requirements. 
and uh, the optimal system becomes more involved. Clearly, you have your adjoint equation as usual. Here, I changed the sign because these are anti-symmetric. Otherwise, I could write here the adjoint and the minus. And the complementarity condition become more complicated. We are just used to, to do this one equal zero, but now I have more uh, variables to take care of the fact that I have these constraints. <clears throat> and uh, I start uh, not putting the L1 function, okay? So that we do step by step. So this is just because we have constraints. Uh, in this case, the complementary system can be also written in a compact form in this way. This is like an implicit way to write the system part of the complementarity system because I can embed the, the, the usual, say, gradient part in this move here. Okay? So, the state of the art in gradient based methods is now to do Newton methods. Newton methods which means to solve for an equation. The equation is here now, the equation which has three components. The equation which is the state, the equation which is the adjoint, and the complementarity condition, which is embedding all these terms that I showed you before. The problem is that because we have these max functions here, this max and mean, we cannot make a simple derivative. We have to think about and generalize the Jacobian, okay? So, but formally, I'm doing exactly a Newton method where I have to invent, say, extend the concept of Jacobian, and then I have a, a Newton equation, which I can solve uh, by any Krilov method and do my update and so solve iteratively my system. So this uh, is a way to write the equation I wrote told you before where I'm, em em say, embedding or coding the non-smoothness uh, in this function of psi. So the function of psi is uh, defined here. In some sense, I'm replacing the max and mean by characteristic functions for which I have uh, a formal way to write by hand what is the derivative, okay? So, uh, there is a lot of mathematics on the, in the background. It's about uh, uh, subdifferential or functional analysis. And one can show about the semi smoothness of this uh, function and the fact that we can use subdifferentials. But this is maybe in this audience not so relevant. Anyway, why can why we write in this way? So if I write to the if I write this encoding, uh, the, say, the original gravity, which now is embedded in many other things, okay, now I could try to do the things more elegant because everything is dependent on the control. So the state is a function of the control. The adjoint is a function of the control. So why not embedding this together and have a reduced form of this uh, uh, Jacobian and therefore work just with you? And everything is written now in a reduced form, which is this one, okay? Again, one can show that this uh, Jacobian is, uh, uh, is coercive, so you have a very nice smooth, uh, Newton method, which is going in the right direction to optimize, okay? Uh, numerically and theoretically, the issue is about convergence. One can prove that these methods are locally superlinear convergence. Superlinear convergence means better than linear, but it's still not quadratic. For sure, BFGS is not quadratic, but this here can become quadratic locally in the vicinity of the optimal form. So the question here, the Newton methods is being solved by some Krilov. Krilov can be just a CG iteration. And the approximation, approximation is done by some discretization scheme, which guarantees uh, normal and uh, all the properties of your uh, original quantum system. And uh, this has all been proved uh, in some other ways. Okay, so 
<clears throat> I would like to apply this uh, to a quantum system. Let's take the Liouville von Neumann equation and uh, with the density operator. And I take uh, this case. So we are staying in a rotating frame of looking at this system with the a magnetic field. And if I look at this, my free Hamiltonian is this in this form. And uh, these are the interaction between two st uh, different speeds. OK, and uh, <clears throat> uh, this form seems different from the original one, but actually is not we, in the real, real uh, matrix representation. The matrix A is uh, this part, this commutator part, and the matrix B is this commutator part. So let me now try to solve uh, a problem where here we can have many spins, and the control function are the two magnetic fields applying to the spin system, okay? If I do this, <clears throat> for example, for two coupled spin, I have uh, my Hamiltonian, I can write this compactly in this way. So I and S are for the two spins and the coupling is here. So what we see here is that uh, when I start my semi-small Newton method, you will see that uh, <clears throat> If I check uh, the, the precision, say, of how you solve the optimality system and how many iterations that I'm doing, so you see that uh, there is a, a decay of this error, of this residual of the gradient, which is uh, quite fast. So if you think of something of high precision, you should try, you should have this kind of numbers in your simulation. Oh. And uh, in the this is the unconstrained case, and this is the constrained case, I mean, where the box, the constraints on the control are active. They are touching the water. So essentially, it's uh, like the same thing. I should remark also that there was a comment before that in the Newton methods, nobody is assembling an Hessian. Okay? There is no need to assemble a Hessian. It is always about the action of a Hessian on a vector. And this is done by twice calculating uh, a forward and backward linearized uh, equations of our original state and adjoint equation. So there is no, no Hessians stored anywhere. <clears throat> OK, so let me just to relax a second, uh, make a picture. OK, this is uh, just. Uh, the two controls uh, for the two things. There is another one. Can you? Can we? So this is about uh, two hundred times five, so thousand spins applied. The same way. You see, in this case, so there is a there was an active control on this. Okay. Okay. Now let's uh, take the case where there is L one. L1 regularization, then the complementary system becomes more complicated. We still have the box constraints, and all these can be encoded again in a complementarity equation involving uh, semi-smooth functions, so max and mean. So this is this long expression is encoding all these uh, variables of our KGT system. And again, I can think of my forward equation, my adjoint, and my complementarity equation as a system to solve in a Newton fashion. So now we can do again uh, same smooth Newton as before, think the same details, the same comments as before. And we can prove, uh, it can be proved, uh, it has been proved that this also is a superlinear convergent, which means this kind of behavior that you have seen uh, before. The other things that you can see is that now, if I increase gamma, gamma is now the weight of the L1 function, the, cost, the, co the control will become smaller and smaller until it will disappear, it will become zero. So this uh, gamma bar is uh, the, the critical value. And uh, I would like to show this because now we will see that the control will come automatically like a pulse without it, I say anything where the paths are, how the paths are made, okay? So let me take uh, uh, the model, which was actually mentioned in the talk before by Apostar. 
No, this is just uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, one spin uh, with the one control, a uh, two spin uh, and calculate with one control, and I use uh, my semi smooth neutral method, and you see again. Now what I'm doing, I'm trying, uh, I'm starting very far from the solution, and uh, what I do is so-called globalization. I do a line search at the beginning, because as you know, the Newton method has this convergence property only locally when you are close. So to guarantee the convergence, you do a line search. So in the beginning, it seems that the line search requires to make smaller steps, and you are not improving uh, very much. And then suddenly, you see that uh, the line search has become one, and you come to, OK, this is uh, small now. 10 to minus 16. So you are now very accurate in solving your null smooth optimality system. And uh, I would like to show you uh, again this uh, video. So this uh, kind of, uh, of evolution, if you see, the control, as you see, is a parts control. There is sparsity. You see there are parts where the control is 0. This is the L1 function. And this is the box constraint. I haven't said where the parses are. They come automatically from solving the optimization problem. The control problem has been solved. OK, so you can see also here in this picture that uh, as you increase the weight of the L1 function, you will see that sparsity increases. So will be more and more regions of, your, of the time horizon where the control function is zero just are increasing gamma. OK, so now let me do something challenging, more challenging, which is uh, I consider the origin, the problem is before. I take the L2 control. I take the L1 control. And I am still not happy. I would like to do more. I put a uh, discontinuous control. So this is like L1 but it will be active only if the control comes in pointwise beyond the threshold, this threshold is S. So if uh, the control remains below this threshold, we could also think to solve the problem without uh, having uh, the penalization, right? And uh, I also consider the standard box constraints is here. So the problem is how we solve this problem. Here, in this case, there is no semi-smoothness. There is no gradient. There is even no sub-differential. And we go back to another way of doing optim optimal control, which is uh, back to Pontryag. So let me go back to Pontryag. So Pontryag, uh, we have the same uh, adjoint equation, obviously. In fact, the word adjoint equation is, uh, was first written in the book of Pontryagin in 1956. And we work with an Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is uh, the adjoint uh, variable, scalar product with the dynamics, minus my running cost, OK? Which uh, we have seen in other talks. But here, there is no differentiability at all. And in fact, the point of talking about Pontryagin is uh, Essentially, only if you have an Hamiltonian which is not differentiable. Because if it is differentiable, it is not Pontryagin. It is uh, the Lagrange formalism in Hamiltonian form. So in this case, I do not need the differentiability because the principle of Pontryagin is that if this, the solution XU, because you, this is a necessary condition, if XU is uh, the solution of your problem, then it must satisfy a maximality condition. And uh, the idea, in fact, here is that we can talk about this without uh, any differentiability of the Hamiltonian function. So this, uh, the proof of this theorem has been done in many ways, but standard is a needle variation, and also by using Ekeland variation of principle. And uh, what we have actually, our optimal system is now the forward equation, adjoint equation, and the maximality condition. Uh, this uh, was proposed in 1952 in a paper, then was a book in 1956. And uh, 
just uh, six years later, comes out a famous paper by Krilov and Chernusko. Actually, it was first Rosoner, Lev Rosoner, who proved that uh, by minimizing the Hamiltonian or maximizing it, depends how you write the Hamiltonian, you will link, reduce your cost function. Okay? So this is a fundamental work by Lev Rosoner before. And then Krilov and Chernusko proposed the first, uh, what is called a successive approximation. So what is the idea? The idea is that you, you solve your forward equation, you solve your adjoint equation, and you maximize your Hamiltonian point-wise in time, okay? There have been many variants of this. There's a nice review by Lubitian, and in fact, Protov is one of these uh, kind of methods. It was well known, and all these authors agreed that this method is not robust because when you do the maximization, depending on the, co on the value of, your, of the parameters of cost functional, you get divergence. And this problem remained open until uh, uh, Sarkavish Shindo proposed to do a sort of penalization. This has many names, actually. It's also well known in uh, Rockefeller and Proximal Gradient. So the idea is that uh, we have a parameter such that the update that we do cannot be so far away from the previous update, which is this W. Okay? But still, Sakawa and Shindo did, uh, like as you know, in Krotov, they updated the state and control function at the same time, which is very cumbersome because it, uh, we want to use this with the infinite dimensional systems, as I have done. So, how to do this? Well, there are two weak points here. One is epsilon is fixed, and the other is uh, insisting in solving also the forward equation or the adjoint with the control. This is not possible. This is not, uh, I mean, it's not a good thing. So let's uh, work on the theory, and one can prove that it is always possible to choose an epsilon depending on the, on the, in the iteration we are doing such that you can guarantee monotonic reduction of the cost functional by changing epsilon and doing the maximization of the, the Hamiltonian function with that epsilon. So these are results that have been published uh, recently. And they also one shows that uh, then one decouples the updates of the state function from the control. Okay. So, Yes, it's that. Okay. So the, the algorithm looks very much like proto scheme. And uh, the point is here, yeah, there is no link uh, with the state that joint variable. The state is solved, the joint is solved, the old values. You have a maximization of the Hamiltonian. And then you have to choose the epsilon such that you guarantee the monotonicity for the next step. Okay. So this is all, this well postness of the algorithm is all proved. By, there is some theoretical work uh, behind this. Okay, the other beautiful thing is that when you have decoupled the state from the control in your Hamiltonian, then solving the maximization of Hamiltonian is by hand. You don't need to search for a minima, you just do some analytic calculation, even if you have a discontinuous function, even if you have a non smooth function, or if you have L1 function. You just can sit down and do the calculation and get the candidates for the maximization. Then you have to compare the value of the Hamiltonian, of the argumented Hamiltonian for this company. And uh, uh, doing this, one can prove uh, many things. One can prove uh, well positive of the system, monotonicity, convergence in a weak sense, in the sense that if there is differentiability, the solution is going to converge to the, the gradient zero. So we close the circle with the Lagrange uh, thing. And we have also convergence uh, in it. So this is the math, what you want. This is the best uh, possible. And uh, let me use the SQH, this method I call SQH, sequential quadratic Hamiltonian. And uh, let's do L1 with box constraints. Yeah, it's very beautiful. I don't need to do complementarity. I just need to have this maximization of the, the Hamiltonian. And uh, 
I can solve for different uh, values of this gamma. You see the sparsity again. And uh, surprise, surprise, this method is much faster than semi smooth neutral method, which is the fastest, uh, say, state of the art today. So I would say it's even much better. Okay. So, uh, well, what is the beauty of making the discontinuous cost? Well, you can do, you can play it, you can design your passes. You see, in this case, the second, uh, say, plateau is because I have the threshold there. So we have two sparsity passes. And again, if I increase the parameter, I will get to zero values. And, uh, okay, there are some discussion on accuracy of this method as well. Okay, all this is discussed in the, the, my books here. And uh, all these books are together with codes. The codes are all available in computer physics communications. So you can download them. Here there is uh, quite a lot about semi-smooth, semi-smooth with L1, semi-smooth with constraints, uh, the monotonic scheme. Uh, this is uh, for shredding uh, infinite dimensional, and this is uh, with the density functional theory, so time-dependency functional theory, so you can also try this. Otherwise, you find something in my GitHub. And uh, this, uh, the, the yellow book is about everything about Pontryagin, the theoretical and numerical aspects that I've mentioned to you. If I would be like happy if you ever look at it. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I thank all my friends, uh, the students that have worked with me with this in the last, say, more than 10 years. And uh, I have a PhD position available to continue this uh, working on multiparticles. So if someone is interested, I would be very happy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh,